to our first ever Latinx and Kidlit Book Festival. My name is Diana Lopez and I am so happy to be here moderating this wonderful panel of picture books in the age of activism. Uh, and I want to start by uh, giving us a little introduction to each of our panelists and uh, having them share very briefly, two minutes, <laughs> uh, a little bit about the, the books that they're going to be uh, discussing today. Uh, and so Magdalena Mora is a picture book illustrator and graphic designer. She is the illustrator of Equality's Call, the story of voting rights in America, written by Deborah Dyson and released earlier this year. She is also the illustrator of I Wish I, You Knew, written by Jackie Azua Kramer, one of our fellow panelists, which will be out in May of 2021. Magdalena? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Magdalena, or Maggie. Um, and today, like Diana said, I'll be talking about Equality's Call, and I Wish You Knew. Um, this is Equality's Call, and I think we'll be showing a little bit of I Wish You Knew later, um, but Equality's Call, um, written by Deborah Diason, is a nonfiction picture book about the history of voting rights in the U.S. that starts with the signing of the Constitution all the way up until present day. And so it really touches upon a lot of the movements um, and a lot of the fights that were fought to, um, so that we can have the voting rights that we do today. It also touches upon a lot of the work that there's still left to do. Um, and I think my favorite part of the book though, is that it gives sort of an overview of the central players in the fight for voting rights. So a lot of activists, a lot of leaders um, and, it also runs parallel to the story of a classroom learning about voting rights. Um, yeah. Wonderful and such a relevant book for, you know, what's been going on lately in our country. And I think an important one for our young children to read. Um, next, I'm gonna introduce uh, Jackie Azua Kramer. Uh, she is an award-winning and internationally translated children's book author. Her upcoming picture books for the 2021-2022 season are I Wish You Knew, uh, Dorothy and Herbert, The Story of the Postal Clerk and the Librarian and Their Extraordinary Collection of Art, We Are One, Manolo and the Unicorn, and Miles Won't Smile. She lives with her family in Long Island, New York. When not writing, you'll find her reading, watching old movies, and traveling to her family's roots in Ecuador, Puerto Rico and Spain. So tell us about your book, Jackie. Hi, Diana, and hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be part of this lovely panel with Eric, Sylvia, and Maggie, or Magdalena, and of course, Diana. But I want to make a little shout out um, to congratulate, felicitaciones a todas las musas, um, especially Ismay, Alex, and Myra for putting together this espectáculo, el primer. Um, Latinx Kid Lit Book Festival. So I just want a little shout out to them because this is amazing. So yeah, um, The Boy and the Gorilla, if you can all see that, is about a little boy who is grieving the loss of his mother um, and an imaginary gorilla um, who um, helps to answer his questions on death and dying. And also in that conversation helps him to find a path to healing and grieving with his father. So, yeah. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> um, and now I'm going to introduce Sylvia Lopez, uh, a Cuba native raised and living in Miami. Uh, Sylvia served as children's library for over three dec decades before becoming a children's author. Her books have received the Latino Book Award, the Florida Book Award, a starred review and book list, and have been chosen as Junior Library Guild selections. She is the author of Queen of Tejano Music, Selena, and um, she's got a, a little golden book of Frida Kahlo coming up, and then another one uh, that's going to be about Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, Sylvia has a Master in Library Science from Florida State University and a specialist degree in Educational Technology from Barry University. Thank you, Diana. I am deeply honored to be part of this wonderful festival and especially of this terrific panel of talented people. 
Yes, my book is um, the one that came out the, in August is uh, Queen of Tejano Music, Selena. It is both in English and in Spanish. So they have the two versions come out. The illustrator is Paola Escobar. I have to, I have to say that this, just the cover alone, uh, the book was selected for um, the American Society of Illustrators because of the because of the artwork that Paola did. It is the story of Selena Quintanilla, who was a Tejana um, performer in the 1980s. Basically, she did most of her work 80s and the early 90s. Uh, it was a wonderful book to write because I got to know a terrific young woman that I knew something about, but not that much until I really went into her story. It was a little difficult because she met with a, an ending that was sad and to, to write about that in a picture book for young children makes it a little bit challenging, but we managed to do it. Um, I, my editor was fabulous, um, Little B Books and Courtney Fahey. And um, this is a very nice story. I think it's inspirational. And I think it, I, I'm doing a lot of presentations and even showing live videos of her in her performances. And I get the kids standing up from their desks and dancing around. So that's always a plus. So this is the one we're going to be talking about today. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. And um, now I'm going to introduce Eric, Eric Velasquez earned his BFA from the School of Visual Arts and has illustrated over 30 books. His first picture book, The Piano Man by Debbie Chocolate, won the Coretta Scott King and John Steptoe Award for New Talent. And in 2010, uh, Eric was awarded the NAACP Image Award for his work in Our Children Can Soar, which he collaborated on with 12 notable children's book illustrators. He also wrote and illustrated Grandma's Records and its follow-up, Grandma's Gift, which won the 2011 Buddha Belpri Award for illustration. Uh, in 2019, he wrote and illustrated Octopus Stew, which has gathered rave reviews and is sure to make you laugh. And his newest book is the much-anticipated Ruth Ob Objects, The Life of Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, by Doreen Rappaport and has just been published by Little Brown Books for Young Readers. Hi. There. Okay. Well, this is a uh, it's a wonderful honor for me to be here sharing the panel with Jackie and Sylvia Magdalena, and today I'm, I'm going to be talking about my book, um, oh, Octopus Stew, which was just recently released as Pulpo Guisado, the Spanish version, which I was hoping <laughs> I would have by today, but I haven't uh, received my shipment. And also to mention um, Schomburg, the man who built the library. The life of Arturo Schomburg, who was his, a historian and uh, an activist, and also he collected tons of artifacts. Um, and he's basically uh, the the father of, of African American history in that he, he collected so many books and, and materials on just the existence and the contribution of people of African descent to world culture. Um, you know, so that so. It's an honor to be here uh, and discussing these wonderful topics. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I, I'm a, I feel honored too. And uh, I want to say in my excitement to hear from you guys and hear about your books, uh, I, I forgot to um, invite the, the audience to please um, read our anti-harassment um, policy in our chat box. Uh, uh, and I also forgot to maybe introduce myself a little bit. <laughs> uh, so yes, I'm Diana Lopez and uh, I also write middle grade books. I wrote a book called Confetti Girl and my latest book is called Lucky Luna and, uh, and they take place in my hometown of Corpus Christi, Texas. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, I was so thrilled to have the opportunity to moderate a panel uh, about activism in picture books. Um, I, I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with this, but you know, in 2012, um, the Tucson School District had a banning of almost 40 um, books, many of them by Latinx authors. And, uh, and in protest, a bunch of people went over to Tucson and kind of congregated uh, at, a, at a, a community center. And I was most impressed by the young people that went up and spoke 
in favor of books and and with tears in their eyes as they wanted those you know um, books to be reinstituted into uh, their schools uh, and so this idea of activism and then just seeing these young people become activists is very moving for me so i would like to kind of start by asking um, you guys to discuss um, which books novels or personal experiences uh, have informed you uh, as a writer or as an illustrator with a focus on activism. And to kind of make this, uh, you know, uh, a little, I don't know, spontaneous, I have some post-its, pink, blue, white, and purple. And Maggie, I'm going to ask you to pick a color. What color are you going to pick? Uh, I'll do purple. purple. Purple, okay. And the name on the purple post-it is Eric. So Eric, you get to go first. Um, <laughs> which, uh, That's which tricky. Books, Great. Thank you. <laughs> personal experiences have informed you as a someone with an interest in activism? Well, I think for me, it all begins uh, the day I, I started reading James Baldwin. Um, it begins um, when I was at the School of Visual Arts. I read the story Sonny's Blues in one of the um, anthologies. And there I saw that uh, the main character lived on 114th Street. And here I was on 113th Street and 7th Avenue reading about a character, you know, that was on 114th Street and Lenox. And it really blew my mind that here on these the pages of this book, you know, I was reading about a character that I can I can literally walk to within three minutes. From that point on, I, I devoted the, my life to just reading everything that James Baldwin had has ever written. Um, I even traced the steps into like where he lived. About uh, two years ago, was we went to the south of France, and I went to the James Baldwin home. So for me, he is like the alpha and the omega in terms of his activism with his writing. Um, he was friends, of course, for those that don't know, with. Martin Luther King Jr. The, the, and with the Malcolm X, uh, Medgar Evers. Uh, there are these uh, this iconic um, documentaries on him, most notably, I Am Not Your Negro, based on the, his uh, unfinished novel. Um, but for me, he's always been a big, big inspiration. And in terms of visuals, um, I would always say that that's Tom Feelings, who was like the uh, really, um, he was like a mentor for me. Uh, you know, I was able to um, maintain a friendship with him, let's say the last five years of his life. He would call me regularly and we would discuss a lot of ideas. And in fact, you know, I, I would say that, you know, in terms of how to take uh, my ideas and, and, and be more, let's say, um, proactive with, with, with my beliefs and putting it into the work and almost in a subversive way, um, bring forth <laughs> my message uh, to, to the kids, it, not just in my work, but the work that I do for other people. Um, you know, he, he played a big part of that. So come on, James Baldwin and Tom Felix, what? To me, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, those are great, great inspirations. I can totally understand. <laughs> so you get to pick the next person. I've got blue, pink, and white. Uh, I, blue, pink, and white. I see red in the middle. What's oh, that? it's pink, but you can say red if you want. <laughs> All right, or or magenta. Yes. <laughs> yeah, blue in the middle. <laughs> the one in the middle, that is Magdalena. So yeah. Magdalena, how about uh, your inspirations? Yeah, I think um, when I was thinking of this question, um, what immediately came to mind were um, the House of the Spirits and In the Time of the Butterflies um, by Julia Alvarez and Isabel Allende. And I think growing up, um, maybe maybe I'm wrong about this, but I don't remember there really being like a young adult genre. And so um, those books kind of served as my young adult novels. Um, and they were the first time I had <coughs> Latina characters. Um, it was the first time I had seen this, um, a story about adolescence that also really tied into the political landscape and like a certain climate and a certain political climate um, and how someone's adolescence could also be their discovery of how they were gonna become 
involved in their communities. Um, and that I think that really resonated with me because I come from a family, um, not all of them would identify as activists, but um, they're all educators. And so I think we were always talking or thinking about um, about movements and they were always sort of like trying to expose me and my brother to um, what was going on in the world. And so I think I really resonated with um, these characters in, in the books who were trying to find their own way just as people, but those were, that was so closely aligned and intertwined with um, their discovery of who they were gonna be as like citizens of the world. Um, and so I think I, yeah, those books made such a lasting impression on me. Um, and then as far as artwork, this is probably such, such a cliche at this point, um, but Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, um, my family would go back to Mexico and we would make a point usually um, when we were in Mexico City to see their murals and for to see the murals of Diego Rivera in person. Um, and I think they made such a lasting impact on me, um, but also the work of Frida Kahlo, which maybe isn't overtly political, but it does talk about sort of, um, I think, you know, it was impossible for her to divorce the, what was going on in the world from her personal experiences as a woman and as a painter. Um, and so I think I, I saw so much of um, what I wanted to do in the world and what kind of marks I wanted to make um, through their work. Well, I don't think it's cliche. I just think that they're, you know, they are just such magnificent uh, artists that many of us are inspired by their works. Thank you so much for sharing. So you get to pick the next person. I have blue and white. I'm gonna do blue. Blue, that's Sylvia. So oh, okay. Sylvia, you wanna share? <laughs> okay, same question, all right? Same question. Yeah, okay. Well, um, I gave this question a lot of thought and um, I thought, okay, well, part of the question was uh, your personal experiences. And so I'm gonna start with that. I am a refugee rather than just the person who was, you know, came over as an immigrant, many of us did, or daughter of immigrants. No, I came over as a refugee. And um, I think that shaped a lot of my, um, um, activism. Uh, I came to Miami at a time when Miami was not what it is today, filled with Latinos and Hispanics. And so I did see some, a little bit of injustice around me, but at the same time, I did get to see a lot of and meet a lot of wonderful people who were very, um, very concerned and very uh, conscious. And I saw how they functioned with us who were just new arrivals and so that kind of shaped me um that was a you know a long time ago um as far as books are concerned um i don't want to say that i'm ocd but when i became a librarian since i had missed the first few years of education here i mean i had done it in cuba but i had missed elementary school here basically and i became a children's librarian I said, oh my gosh, I mean, I had read a lot, but I became very focused and I read through all the new berries, including the honor books from Dr. Doolittle back in the 1920s to whatever year I was in, systematically. And I, and of course, all the Caldecotts. And I realized um, something that I had always known. I gravitate toward history, historical fiction. I like, I cannot even name one at this moment but I, I gravitate towards books that have to do with a period in life or a period in history in which there were events that were um, unjust, like slavery, the Holocaust, for example. And I like to see how that event shapes the lives of the characters who are maybe fictional characters and how those characters emerge as better people. And so those were the books that really have impacted me in the sense of activism. All of those wonderful children's books that have a topic dealing with an event like that and how the uh, characters were better for them. Um, so that's, that's how those, that's, those are mine. Thank you so much for sharing. And thank you so much for all of your years as a librarian because you really are a, a kind of curator of books for our young readers. Thank, thank you. you.
And Jackie, you're the last one. So what do you want to at least? Yes. Well, I'm, yeah, so I'm going to speak um, specifically on personal experiences. Uh, when I was growing up, I was the only Latina girl in a Catholic school, um, Ecuadorian, um, Puerto Rican, and um, Spanish. And I remember bringing my lunches to school <laughs> of uh, frijoles and arroz and chicken. And the kids would like look at my food like it was like that scene, the big fat Greek wedding. I don't know if any, any of you saw it, but like, you know, what is that, you know? And I immediately started to think, oh gosh, I wish I could have just a plain white bologna sandwich like everybody else had. But um, my parents crowned me when I was a little girl as the little lawyer, la abogada in the family. Um, I was fortunate enough and privileged enough to travel around the world with my family. And um, when I saw what I would say is the good and the not so good, and I knew the difference and it stayed with me. Um, like this picture that I wanna share with you, if you can all see it. This is a picture that was shared by Eduardo Diaz, the director of the Smithsonian Latino Center, uh, recently at the SCBWI nonfiction conference. Uh, can you all see that? And it is a picture taken by Dorothea Lang uh, during the Depression era. And what you see here is a man holding a child. But what was fascinating is what she wrote at the bottom. And she wrote, future voter and his Mexican father. And I thought, boy, does this not say it all? I mean, these are, we as creators are writing for these children. This is our changing world. This is our changing color of our world. And as Eduardo Diaz uh, uh, put it, that 25% of the kids in school today are Latinx. So these are the personal influences that inspire me. And, um, um, Magdalena mentioned House of Spirits and Isabel Allende, of course, in terms of a book. Yes, that, you know, really, I read that actually more than once and gave me pride in place of, of who I am and wanted me to, I wanted to discover more about myself. And I do a lot of that through travel. And I do that also um, through art. I just, I can spend hours in museums all kinds of museums all over the world. It is so impactful to me, so yeah. Oh, I'm a, I'm a museum person too. I just love, uh, <laughs> I just, I love looking at the artifacts and then reading the little stories right. and uh, my family gets very impatient <laughs> because of like, you don't really slide it. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna move to the next question. And um, you know, this one is uh, uh, kind of goes back to our topic of, of activism. The proposal for this panel discusses um, change agents defined as people who promote or enable change to happen. So, in what way? In what way are you a change agent? And in what way um, can the children that you write for become change agents themselves? And so now I'm going back to my cards, but this time they have A, B, C, and D <laughs> on them. And Jackie, since you went last, you get to pick the first letter, A, B, C, or D. Okay. Let's go with B. B, and that is Sylvia. So Sylvia. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. I love that question. That was a very, very good question. Um, I noticed that it had... Um, Three parts. Like I said, I'm not OCD. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just very thorough. So, um, in what way am I the agent of change? And I, could I be an agent of change? Well, Diana, you mentioned um, that I am a librarian, and to me, that profession was the perfect profession for me because I was a bookworm, and then I studied education, and then I thought, well, all right. So, what better? You know, to, I love libraries. I love children. So let's put them together, and that's where I ended up for so many years. And I think I was an agent of change, or at least I tried my best to be, because um, I was. It, it gave me an opportunity to try to motivate my students to read, 
we can write wonderful books, beautiful books, but they do no good if nobody reads them. If they just sit on the shelf or, you know, nobody picks them up. So I made it my mission to promote, promote, promote and motivate. And I think that that helped. Uh, one of the things that always struck me was the first question a child will ask you is, have you read it? And if you say, no, but I read the review and it was very good, they walk away. But if you tell them, yes, I read the book, it was great. And then you tell them a little bit about it, you've got a reader. So as an agent of change, me being able to be in that profession where I directly made an impact, if I, if I tried to make an impact on the children, that was, that was perfect for me. Um, as far, you also had, um, let me see, my protagonist. My protagonist was not so much an agent of change, it's not what she set out to be, but I think her persona and the fact that she was a performer in the public eye, very much in the public eye, she was able to bring about a change in the perception of people, especially young Latina women and girls. And, and I think she was also an agent of change. And how can children be an agent of change? I think if they read our books and we introduce them to our books um, and our you know good quality books, books with a good message, um, and they, they read them and they if it motivates them to go out and pick up a cost and do something good uh, because our books or any book that they have picked up and, and, and have read and have enjoyed, if that helps them and makes them do that, then I think they've become agents of change for the future. So that's, that's why books are so, so important because they, they are the inspiration for change. Um, okay, so you get to pick the next person. We have A, C, and D. Okay, uh, let's go with D. D, and that's Eric. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, well, um, at the risk of sounding kind of like an egoist. All right, when I wrote Grandma's Records, um, as an Afro-Latino, uh, a lot of people were like, what's that? You know, so it was like one of your parents is like African-American and one of your parents is Latino. Like, nope, both my parents come from Puerto Rico. We speak Spanish at home and this is who I am. So by the time I wrote that in the years that, that followed, I would meet people at my book signings uh, that would travel. Um, like one person in particular said, I drove five five hours just to meet you uh, because I've never seen any books uh, that portrayed Afro-Latinos in, in, you know, on its pages. There was this one uh, woman that showed up with her daughter. They were in tears because uh, the daughter was teased in school and bullied, you know, because, you know, she looked like me, but came from a Latino household and no one really understood you know, understood her. So, you know, it, you know, once they, it was like grandma's records was a validation for these people. So I started to realize how powerful just the images are for some people, especially if they don't see themselves represented. Uh, so grandma's records became a very special book, um, I think for a lot of people because of that. All right, so I also teach at uh, FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology. I teach a children's book class. Um, and one year in particular, a young man, his name was Charles George at the time, um, who was seemingly African-American, says to me, uh, Professor, can I talk to you after class? I'm like, sure. And he says, I want you to know that because of you, I am now changing my name back to its original, my original name. I'm like, you mean your name is not Charles George? He says, no, my name is Charles George Esperanza. I am also Afro-Latino de Puerto Rico, de Culebra. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> and he said, you are my inspiration. I was prepared to live the rest of my life as Charles George. But just seeing you here, dealing with you, this is it. You know, and, and the idea of that, I will now be accepted. And I asked him, like, why did you drop the name in the first place? Because even on the road book, his name is Charles George. And it was like the same thing, the, the bullying, you know, the just um, the resistance to just accepting him as an Afro-Latino or just Latino, uh, part of the whole Latinx community. Um, and so in the years since, so Grandma's Records was published like in 2001 in hardcover, the original, it's still in print, 
but I've noticed more Afro-Latinos have joined the literary community. Uh, I am so proud of the queen, Elizabeth Acevedo, who's just killing it out there, uh, who proclaimed me the original G when I... <laughs> <laughs> Um, because she told me that her mother used to read grandma's records to her when she was growing up. So the idea that, um, you know, it wasn't my, I didn't, I didn't realize this was going to happen, but, you know, I am so proud of the fact that just more Afro-Latinos are making their way into the literary world and just even all other um, aspects of the arts, the art community. So, yeah. Wonderful. Yes. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and move us forward a little bit because we're getting close to our Q&A time. Um, Jackie, you want to share um, your response to the question? Oh, yeah, um, which is a great question, Diana. Um, so I come from, like all of us, a, a rich and diverse tapestry of experiences, culture, race, faith, politics, society, all of which influences my work but more and more i feel responsible to take these observa observations and experiences of mine and turn them into stories that reflect a truer and fuller history and at the same time allow and welcome children right who come from those very diverse and rich tapestries of experiences um, and to your second question, how can children today, young people today, um, be change agents or activists? I'm going to say to you, I, I feel like I have little advice to give young people today in terms of activism. I feel like they're activated. And by that, I mean, I just, <laughs> I just uh, printed this article that was published by the Washington Post this past April. And I don't know if you can see it, but it says 12 kids who are changing their communities and our world. And I just want to share one or two examples. Here's Cao Rodolfo, 11 years old from Brazil. His cause is raising, here's a little picture of him, raising environmental awareness. And he said, the way I see it, the planet is in big trouble and it's up to, up to kids to solve it. So he started planting trees in the southern Brazilian city of Curuchiva, one after the other. Another example. That's Sydney. A, Ke Sydney oh, that's Keys. amazing, Jackie. I want to make sure that we give uh, Matt Magdalena a little bit of time. Oh, I'm end. sorry. Okay, sure, before, sure, sure. But, but I just, love that article. Um, you should share it with all of us so we can. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I just want to quickly say that if anything, activism starts with the question. Start with the question, listen and interact with the answer, and with kindness and compassion, make the change you want to see. Very wise, very wise. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Magdalena, how about you? Yeah. Um, so, for the first part of the question, I think I'm still very much figuring out how to be an agent of change. I think that's probably a question I'll keep asking um, for for forever and that I think those answers are going to change. And so, um, you know, I think art can be an incredibly powerful tool for change and for activism. Um, and so, you know, I, I do hope that I can kind of like find my path within that. But I think for kids, um, the thing that I want to say is that um, like movements need everyone and to be an agent of change doesn't look like one specific thing. You know, I think we have this idea that a change agent looks like someone giving the fiery speech on the podium, which um, movements require everyone and there's a place for everyone. And so maybe you're not making the speech, maybe you're writing it, maybe you're drawing the posters for it. I think um, kids, are so talented and have so much insight. And so um, to be involved in our communities, um, you know, I think they can just look at how they can personally be involved rather than following some idea or some image of what a change agent looks like. That's a wonderful answer. You guys are such a, a treat and a joy to, to talk to. <laughs> I feel like we could just talk about this, you know, I, I hope someday we get to have this conference in person and uh, we can continue it afterwards, you know. Um, but now it's time for us to open the door to our audience 
and give them a chance to ask you some questions. Uh, and so let's see what the first question is. Here we go. Chris, a fourth grader in the Bronx, New York, also wants to know, in the picture on the cover of the book Octopus Do, are you and your sister when you were smaller representing the cover? So this is for you, Eric. <laughs> that, that, you know, when I read the question, it's like, I, I, I don't have a sister. I was an only child. So, uh, <laughs> but I can say that that's like a young version of me and then the sister would be my wife. So <laughs> we are representing on the cover. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and so our next, um, thank you, yes, for Eric Velasquez. <laughs> well, we figured that out. Great. At what age did you write your first book? Wow. So what age I wrote my first book? So when I was a kid, I would make my own comic book. So I started that at about the age of nine. And then uh, at a I'm at the age of <clears throat> I wrote, uh, grandma's records and then it was published. So, so the first one at nine and the second one, <clears throat> there you go. <laughs> okay. You know, but but I think uh, readers love, especially like young readers, they always want to know how old you were when you, were, when you wrote your first mm -hmm. book. So maybe the rest of you can also chime in on that question. Yikes. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> I, wrote I, I wrote just like Eric. I wrote little comic books when I was little, and all of that was left behind in Cuba. Oh. And I would give anything to have just one of my old pictures. I'm not an artist, but just my little illustrations and my little stories. I didn't. I I wrote little stories, kept them in my computer or in little pieces of paper. But I will tell you that I wrote my first book at the age of 68. <laughs> okay, my Wonderful. first traditionally published, so it's never too late. Never yes. Too late. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, um, I can answer. I I wrote my first book um at eight and I believe it was called Herbert Finds a Home. And I have a twin brother and it was about a mouse who has a perfect twin gets really frustrated with that twin and so decides to find a new family. Um, <laughs> more or less just throwing shade at my twin brother, but um, I'm very proud of it. So. so I'll jump in there um, and piggyback off of Eric and Diana. I used to cut out the comic strips and glue them on a piece of paper. Oh, Diana's nodding. And then I would write my own story underneath that. And even younger than that, I used to take picture books, even before I could read. And I would read them aloud to my mother who didn't speak English fully yet at the time, but I was already speaking English. And she told my teacher, she said, oh my gosh, Jackie, she's reading already. And she was kind of like, uh, I don't think so. And it was that I was literally making up my own stories. And my mother thought, that I was, you know, reading. So, yeah. Excellent. All of us were young when we really started loving books. Yes. Uh, so the next question, what do you keep in mind when writing a picture book? And this is from uh, Yuna M, an eighth grader in South Carolina. And so I'm going to just, uh, I have uh, Magdalena here on my <laughs> post-it. So you want to start first? Yeah. Um... So I haven't written a picture book yet. I've only illustrated books. Um, so I think my process would probably be a bit different from the authors on the panel, but I think I always try, honestly, I always try to keep in mind the author. Um, I try to do right by the story. Um, the books that I've currently been working on have been nonfiction too. And so um, research is always a huge part of the process and I want to, um, do right by like the accuracy of the story and not misrepresent things. Um, but I also want um, to tell a story poetically. And so I think I always kind of have that balance within, yeah, w when I'm working on artwork is how can I be historically accurate, but also how can I um, make this a story that can also be timeless, that can resonate with a lot of kids and that can still bring the poetry um, back into nonfiction. 
Great. Uh, I think we have time for one more person to answer this question. Any of you want to chime in? Jackie, Eric, or Sylvia? Okay, okay Sylvia. I'll chime in. I'll chime in because mine's really short. I keep the reader in mind. I, I if it's, especially if it's a nonfiction, um, I, I want to. I, I I keep in mind how much of what I'm writing do they know? It is called frame of reference. Uh, if 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 it's if if I'm writing about a topic, how much am I going to put in the text, and how much can I put in the back matter? so that it's not too heavy, but I have to keep in mind what it is that they already know and try to make it relevant for them. So I keep the reader in mind when I'm, when I'm writing. Very important. Uh, so next we have a video question. Ellie A, a third grader. <laughs> my name is Ellie and my question is, who's your favorite author? Oh, cute. Oh, favorite authors. Jackie, we'll let you go first. Oh, God. Okay. Um, that is hard for me. I don't like to pick favorite authors because there are so many that I love. Um, but if I were to pick, let's say, certain books right now that I'm loving, and there is one author that I think, it, so in terms of picture books, um, there are so many as part of this Latinx festival that I love. One that I want to share, Juana Martinez Neal, Alma. I just, I absolutely adore that book. And I also love Fry Bread um, by uh, Kevin Noble Mallard. Um, I love that one. Um, so yeah, but one that touched me uh, and all his books as a child was the um, Ezra Jack Keats books, um, especially A Snowy Day. I had never seen anything like that. Um, my grandmother is a, a, was a brown, is, well, she's, uh, may she rest in peace, is a, was a brown woman. And I, she so reminded me of my, um, in the snowy day of my grandmom. And I thought, oh my gosh, somebody else has a grandmom that looks like my grandmom. So, so yeah, so those are my favorites. Eric, you mentioned a Baldwin earlier, but any others? Oh, there are a ton of others. And, uh, and and I'm fortunate enough to say that a lot of them are my friends, like uh, Jerry Kraft and Kwame Alexander. And of course, I mentioned Elizabeth Acevedo. So, you know, um, I have a lot of favorites. So, there you go. Sylvia? Uh, well, we are doing Latinx, but I'm going to veer away from that because there's also many other wonderful authors. And I'm going to give a shout out. Um, there's an author, his name is Chris Van Alsberg, and he, yeah. his children mm -hmm. will know him as oh, the yeah, author sure. of Polar Express and Jumanji. Sure. And his books, to me, illustration wise and just story wise, because he has a little twist at the end of every book, and they're wonderful. Um, and, and I have a mentor, she lives in California, and her name is Ruth Vanderzee. And I'm going to give a shout out to Ruth. She wrote a book called Erica's Story, which is based on a true story of the Holocaust. And it is absolutely gorgeous. And she has another one called Next Year, which is the story of the gold dust. So those are two favorites, although, like Eric said, you could go on and on. And on. <laughs> so many wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Magdalena um, is an illustrator in the true uh, 22 PBs, uh, right, Magdalena? Yeah. And I was, made, I was made, I was drafted into that group this year, which has been fabulous, absolutely fabulous. Every single author and illustrator in that book, in that group of 20 true PBs, which will now be 21 true PBs, um, are all nonfiction picture books and they are fabulous. So those are, I would name those as my favorites. Magdalena? Um, yeah, so I'll just name three, Jason Reynolds, Elizabeth Acevedo, who is the greatest, best, my favorite right now. Um, and then Mariko Tamaki, who does graphic novels um, that usually have, yeah, like young adult protagonists. Um, and when she teams up with Jillian Tamaki, who's an illustrator, it's just perfect. So. Excellent. Well, we've got five minutes left, just enough time for our last question. Um, do you ever think of what the illustrations might look like when you are writing? And this is from Hudson B, a fourth grader in New York. And uh, I'm going to uh, let Eric start. Oh, Jackie's okay. going to start with this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. This question so, so spoke to me um, because I am one of those writers who wishes desperately 
so jealous of Magdalena and Eric that I could be an illustrator because <laughs> I see um, my, when I start to write, I see a beginning, a fuzzy middle and the end, but I see the pictures first. Like um, I studied theater for so long and, um, and I love the movies. So to me, the book has to appear first, like a moving image, like each page turn is like a scene change, right? Act one, act two, or scene one, scene two. So to me, um, I have to see the story, the illustrations first in my mind before I can even sit down and write. It scares me to look at a blank page. Once I see it, then I start to write, yeah. So, and I'll say that I'm the complete opposite, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> I, I have to pretend someone else is going to be doing the pictures in order to write the words. Because if I start thinking about the pictures, I start thinking about my own limitations as an artist. Well, I can't paint that. I've never painted this before. Oh my God, how do I work that out? So I just think of the story. And because I come from more of like an oral tradition, my, my dad is an amazing storyteller and my cousins, all we all still to this day amuse each other by just telling stories on the phone that I, I like to sort of hear the story um, verbally in my head um, as like a story that's being told and then I'll put the pictures to it later. So, so it's interesting <laughs> that you- The opposite. The picture, yeah. And you're the illustrator and I'm the writer. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Is something similar happened for you, um, Magdalena? Um, well, so with the few stories that I'm either working on writing um, or just drafting up, um, I think just because I'm still fairly new to writing, the mm -hmm. images have to come along with the words. Um, I'm hoping it's not like some sort of a crutch, but probably at this point um, I need to think of, or I need to imagine, like picture the, the images before I can actually write. So maybe that'll change. Well, you yeah. can always pretend so what else is going to do the pictures. <laughs> I'll probably steal that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sylvia? Well, I'm going to go with what Jackie say, said. Um, I see an entire video of my story. And I see, the, I see the, the protagonist and all the characters and all the scenes and everything in my mind. Then I need to sit down and write. The, but I see it all first before I see the words. The, the words are in there floating, but I see a video. Um, it's funny because then I'm not an illustrator, so we get whatever <laughs> there will be. Wow. So far, I have not ever been disappointed. The illustrators no from complaints. Have been wonderful, no complaints whatsoever. But usually, they're completely different to my video. <laughs> they, don't, they don't look what I had in mind, but it's fine yeah. because they're gorgeous. So, yeah, I absolutely agree with Jackie. Yeah, I have to, I just have to also throw in my. Uh, kudos to those illustrators because, uh, you know, uh, stick figures is about as detailed as I can get. And, uh, you know, and, and like Jackie and Sylvia, I see the words, but I'm just amazed when I look at the illustrations. And really, picture books are a cooperation. They're a cooperation yeah. of, of words and pictures, and that's what makes them so special. And, and even as we grow older, we, we, we always kind of gravitate uh, to those wonderful, wonderful picture books. Um, you guys were a phenomenal group. I feel so uh, thrilled and honored that I got to spend this a session with you, hearing about your inspirations, hearing about your work in bringing uh, all of these, um, you know, stories of, of movement, of activism, of motivated people to our young readers and, and inspiring a new uh, generation of activists. Uh, and I, to our audience, thank you so much for spending time with us uh, in this Picture Books in the Age of Activism panel. We wish all of you a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.